Hey everybody, welcome to Grace Baptist Church on Sunday, uh, January 10th, 2021. Um, about the only announcement I know of is the uh, Trinity Episcopal has asked us to join them in uh, the journey to racial equity. It's a three-part series that they're going to uh, be sending out. You can, uh, it's a virtual event, so you can do it online. So be watching for that information. It'll probably come from uh, the gift committee or maybe the worship board. So uh, please pay attention for that. Um, other than that, I can't think of any other announcements. I wanna welcome everybody uh, to worship this year. Uh, 2021 is gonna be a great year um, once we get through a few things. So if you'll join me in prayer, we will uh, begin our worship. Creator God, we come to you at the beginning of a new year, a time we normally approach with hope and renewed spirit. But this year, O oh God, this year is different. With all the loneliness, fear, sickness, and helplessness in our world, we would pray for peace and comfort. Help us to care for each other and to strive to live into a deeper relationship with you, because with your grace, surrounding and strengthening us, we can become the light this world needs. In your name, amen. friends, let us enter the second week of 2021 with our prayers. Today we celebrate the lives and birthdays of these of our community. Silas Donovan West, Chris Shuford, Georgia Theriot, Tipton and Ezra Tosco, Carol Hendricks, and the Hendricks' grandchild, Worth Williams II. As we pray for one another and the world, uh, let us pray for John and Phyllis Munson. I heard this week that they both have COVID and are in the healing uh, process. Uh, some of you know that Patty and Gary West have been struggling with COVID infection since early December. I just heard that from Gary that Patty has contracted it a second time and this time it is worse. So let us keep praying for Patty and Gary. We pray for uh, David and Janice's family who have COVID. We continue to pray for uh, Gina and Brian. In a moment of silence, we will pray for these people. Um, lift up their names and then lift up the names of others whose needs bear on your mind and heart this day. And then I will offer uh, a prayer from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. Uh, it is a prayer for the nation. 
These prayers in the Book of Common Prayer have been honed through centuries of praying. So I will begin with uh, their prayer for the nation, and then I will pray that greater prayer that Jesus taught us. So let us pray. O oh God of healing and hope, be with Phyllis and John, Gary and Patty, Gina and Brian, and David and Janice's family. In your holy name, O oh God, hear our prayers. And now for the nation. Lord God Almighty, who has made all peoples of the earth for thy glory, to serve thee in freedom and peace, grant to the people of our country a zeal for justice and the strength of forbearance that we may use our liberty in accordance with thy gracious will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's scripture lesson comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. The good news of Jesus Christ, the message, begins here, falling to the letter of the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Watch closely. I'm sending my preacher ahead of you. He'll make the road smooth for you. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wild, preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem and, as they confessed their sins, were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair habit tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild filled honey. As he preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's spirit, looking like a dove, came down on him. Along with the spirit, a voice, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. At once, the same spirit pushed Jesus out into the wild. For 40 wilderness days and nights, he was tested by Satan. Wild animals were his companions and angels took care of him. The beginning of the gospel, uh, the baptizer and the baptism. Each of the three years of the three-year common lectionary that we use features a different gospel. This year it is Mark, the first of the gospels written. Verse 1 is also the title, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. From this title, all the other gospels are called gospels. When did the story of Jesus begin? Matthew traced it back to Abraham. Luke traced it back to Adam. John traced it all the way back to the dawn of creation. Mark begins it at Jesus' baptism, at the anointing and call of Jesus as the Son of God. No miraculous conception, no birth narratives, no magi from the east, no soaring metaphysical ponderings. Mark is an action-oriented man. As Joe Friday said, just the facts, man. His gospel rushes at breakneck speed from baptism to the cross and resurrection. One of his favorite words is immediately. Scene after scene follows immediately upon the other. So let's begin the new year in the season of Epiphany, that season of showings forth, with Mark's beginning of the gospel at Jesus' baptism. The last time we saw John, he was squalling in his mother's arms at his circumcision and naming. I would have been squalling too. Now we see him in the desert wilderness wearing animal skins and living off wild honey and locusts. He is at the River Jordan and he is preaching and baptizing people. We call him the baptizer. He was a one-man reform movement in first century Judaism. He was calling his nation to repentance. 
to baptism as a sign of that repentance and to the forgiveness of sins. The Jewish historian of the day, Josephus, described him in these words. He was a good man and had exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, to practice justice toward others and piety toward God, and in so doing, join in baptism. John was an uncompromising prophet of God. He saw things in black and white. He publicly condemned Herod for marrying his brother's wife. That and his growing following made him a threat to Herod. And it was not too long before Herod had him arrested and then beheaded. John was also not a fan of the religious leaders and temple authorities, and they were not fans of John. With John, people didn't have to go through the elaborate procedures of sacrifice and purification in order to receive forgiveness. John was baptizing anybody out there in the wilderness for free and people were flocking to him to be baptized. Organized religion is always trying to control the flow of grace, their hand on the spigot of forgiveness. It wants the exclusive franchise on grace. John and later Jesus were upsetting the apple cart. Grace was grace, as free as the flowing Jordan waters. John believed he was offering Israel their last chance to turn from their sins and be saved. The prophet comes, as the cowboy poet put it, just before beyond redemption. But his mission also pointed beyond himself to another. After me, he said, comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In my study at home, I have an old battered print of the famous painting of the crucifixion by Grunewald. Karl Barth, perhaps the 20th century's greatest theologian, had such a print in his study. It pictures Jesus hanging in hideous agony on the cross. On the left, you see Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, the beloved disciple, holding on to one another in horror and sorrow. To the right of the cross is John the Baptist, pointing his almost impossibly long index finger to Christ. There is a Bible in one hand. Uh, there is a small lamb at his feet, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world and his outstretched arm and finger pointing. That was his calling, and it is ours as well, to point to Christ, not to ourselves, but to him. Paul would write to the Corinthians, for what we preach is Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake pointing to Christ. That is what we are trying to do, however well or badly. Trying to get our egos out of the way. Preaching not our vaulted opinions. They do not interest even us after a while. Offering not a spiritual do-it-yourself manual, but pointing to the only one who can finally help. 
Sometimes the Christ we have pointed to has been more the Jesus we have been taught than who he really is. But we're trying, saying, look at him, not at us. And we do so, Paul says, as servants, when the church prefers to rule rather than to serve, it has lost its way and lost its soul. And now the baptism in three short verses. Mark tells us what has happened. Verse 9, Jesus came from Nazareth and was baptized in the Jordan. Verse 10, when he came up out of the water, immediately, yes, immediately, he saw the heavens torn open and the Spirit descending as a dove. Verse 11, a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, the Beloved, in you I am well pleased. In you I take delight. Did anyone else that day hear the voice? Probably not. Was this the first time Jesus heard something like this? I don't think so. From the early years of his life, I think Jesus knew himself as the beloved. From early, he experienced God as Abba, Daddy, Papa, the perfectly loving God, the one with whom he had an intimacy of a relationship of intimacy and confidence and trust. But there, in the river, as they came up out of the sparkling water, it was confirmed. One of the most profound meanings of baptism for us is the receiving into ourselves the message of our belovedness as God's daughter, son, and of God's delight in us. <clears throat> a priest from Detroit traveled to Ireland to be with his uh, uncle Seamus, who had just turned 80. One morning before dawn, they went for a walk along Lake Killarney. They stood side by side and watched the glorious sunrise. Suddenly, the 80-year-old man turned and began to skip down the road, his face radiant. The priest said, Uncle Seamus, you look really happy. I am, lad, the uncle replied. Wish to tell me why, the nephew asked. His uncle replied, you see, me Abba is fond of me very fond of me. This is the delight God takes in you. Feel free to skip to church. But that is not all that is going on at Jesus' baptism. God was adopting Jesus as son, calling Jesus to his mission as the son of God in the world. It was more than a bestowing upon Jesus, a name and a belovedness. It was a call to be about the mission of God in the world. In the Bible, sonship, daughtership entails a calling. What is God calling you to be and to do as daughters, sons of God in the world? And how can we discern this now at this time and place in our lives? Which leads us, yes, immediately to the dramatic scene that comes next. Next verse. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness 40 days. Drove him. Here is the Holy Spirit, not as gentle dove, but as in Celtic Christianity, a wild goose. A wild goose driving us out to where God needs for us to go and where we most need to go. Discerning where God is calling us sometimes entails a time in a wilderness 
a time away from all the voices but God's, a time when things are shaken up and rearranged. It rarely happens in a comfortable chair in the TV room. For Jesus, this discernment of who he was as the Son of God involved a time of temptation, testing, as Mark says it, tempted by Satan. <clears throat> Mark provides no details about the temptations, but it was all about his vocation as the Son of God. Matthew and Luke filled out some of the details. Would he turn stones into bread when he got hungry? Would he aspire to be the emperor of the world? Would he do a somersault off the top of the temple and parachute himself gently to the ground surrounded by angels to prove to all who saw that he was indeed the Son of God? What kind of son of God would he be? Would he be a minister for himself or for others? Would he rule or would he serve? Would he be spectacular, the golden chosen one, immune to the dangers of life? Or would he go faithfully, trustingly, bravely about his mission all the way to the cross. I think we all have similar sets of testings and temptations about what kind of daughter or son of God we will be. We can try to be more than God has created us and called us to be and to do in our grandiosity and overweening pride or we can be less than what God has created and called us to be, shrinking back, playing small, settling for less than what God has in store for us. What will we do with our belovedness? Our calling is not a dreary obligation, but the freedom to be exactly who you are. The poet Mary Oliver asks, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What a way to start a gospel. What a way to start the year. A baptism, a belovedness, a calling, to something more and something new. Amen. And now hear the benediction. Depart now in the fellowship of God, and as you go, remember, in the goodness of God you were brought into this world. By the grace of God you have been kept all the day long even unto this hour, by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen. Mm -hmm.